Hi there, my name is Prerag Jutani. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Stanford. I create a lot of medical, medical education videos, and today I wanted to talk a bit about delirium, and specifically, what is delirium? I'm gonna give a delirium 101 overview. I'm gonna talk about how we manage it, and specifically, I'm gonna be talking about a study that focuses on the utilization of antipsychotic medications for delirium and whether or not they work. Before we begin, it's always very important to set the basics. What is delirium? Delirium is a disorder of attention and awareness that often develops acutely, which means it's pretty fast, and tends to fluctuate. Um, and this is something that's very important to understand, acutely and fluctuation. This sets delirium apart often from dementia, which tends to be more chronic in nature, develops over time, and is longer lasting, whereas delirium happens much more acutely and is faster. Um, the other interesting part about delirium is that it tends to fluctuate. So someone might be very delirious in the hospital at nighttime, but in the morning they might be super with it. Again, very fluctuation. There's two different subsets of delirium. There's hypoactive delirium, which is interestingly about 75% of cases of delirium. And then you also have hyperactive or, or mixed delirium. Hyperactive delirium is often much more active. So these patients tend to be a li little bit more agitated. They might be able to cause a bit more havoc, whereas someone who's hypoactively delirious might be a bit more somnolent, may not be as responsive. The criteria for these aspects of delirium are listed here. So hyperactive means that you have increased motor activity, loss of control of activity, restlessness, whereas hypoactive delirium, which is commonly mistaken for depression or dementia, usually has decreased rate of speech, reduced awareness. Um, and you can see that sometimes you can have um, combination of symptoms between both of these, which is known as mixed subtype of delirium. So today I'm going to be talking about a how to diagnose delirium, and then I'm going to be talking about a specific study that was done to evaluate what is the best way to manage delirium. You may know that sometimes when someone is delirious and they're agitated, we give them medications, and we'll talk a bit about what those medications are. But are those medications actually effective? First of all, two steps back. How do we diagnose del delirium? The way we diagnose delirium is through what's called the CAM method. What does CAM stand for? Confusion Assessment Method. This is the most useful bedside assessment tool. It's 82% sensitive and 99% specific. And the way you, way you utilize CAM is right here. Feature one, feature two, feature three, and feature four. Feature one, acute onset or fluctuating course. Feature two, inattention, not being able to entirely focus on what's going on. Feature three is disorganized thinking, kind of flipping from one thing to the next. And feature four is altered level of consciousness. So initially, maybe they are super with it, and then next time they're not. The way you diagnose delirium is you, you often need you definitely need features one and two, and then you need either three and four. So you need to be showing acute onset and inattention, or, and then you also need disorganized thinking or an altered level of consciousness. Now let's talk a bit about the fact about why is delirium important? Well, recognizing delirium in critically ill patients shows that it's often associated with excess mortality, longer length of stay, and distress. So if you're able to recognize delirium and treat it properly, there is the hope that you can probably address some of these longer aspects of delirium that we haven't been able to control as well. The trial I'm going to be talking to you about today is called the Mine USA trial. It was from 2018. And what it did is that it took 1,183 patients with ARDS or shock as well as um, evidence of delirium, and it randomized them to getting zepracidone, which you may know as a second generation antipsychotic, and haloperidol, zepracidone or haloperidol or placebo. And so to kind of tell you a bit more about these medications, I just want you to know, zepracidone is a second generation antipsychotic, and haloperidol is a first generation antipsychotic. First generation antipsychotics do have a black box warning saying that they have increased risk of all cause mortality among patients with dementia. That's why it's very important to to know that when someone is getting these medications, it's not without risk. They are at very high risk of potentially having increased risk of mortality, especially if they have a dementia. The other black box warning for second generation antipsychotics is the increased risk of stroke and mortality also in patients with dementia. So just something to think about because oftentimes when patients have delirium, they may have underlying dementia. So giving these medications is not always a bad idea, but you do want to know that there is a black box warning on these medications. 
So now, again, we're going to be talking about this trial. So what they did is they took 1,183 patients with ARDS or shock and hypoactive and, hy and hypoactive or hyperactive delirium, and they randomized them. So let me just show you what this means. They initially took these patients, right? They, these are the patients who had informed consent, 1,183. They screened these patients every day to see if they developed delirium or not. Uh, 571 were ineligible because they did not delir develop delirium, uh, and then 46 were excluded. And here are the reasons why they were excluded. For the patients that did develop delirium, you'll see that, um, again, you diagnose delirium using the CAM assessment, right? But of those patients that developed delirium, 566 did that. They were all randomized into those three groups. I told you that 184 were assigned to placebo, 192 were assigned to haldopyridol, and 190 were assigned to zepracidone. Again, this is a first-generation antipsychotic, and this is a second-generation, and placebo is, of course, nothing, right? It's just a pill, but you don't know what, it, um, you don't know what you're getting. Placebo means nothing. So the results showed that delirium developed in 566 patients, and of those 566 patients, 89% had hypoactive delirium and 11% had hyperactive delirium. This is very important to remember because, as I told you, the prevalence of hypoactive delirium is actually quite high, but it's often not as acknowledged in the hospital because you don't see it, right? Hyperactive delirium, you physically see it. You see someone being restless. You see someone getting agitated. But someone who's hypoactive, sometimes they're just sleepy. They're not as awake. They're not as alert. And so it's tougher to pick up. But it is very important to be doing those um, CAM assessments regularly because hypoactive delirium is much more prevalent than you think. Then what they did is um, they looked at a primary endpoint. Of those patients who had delirium, they got randomized to placebo, Haldol, and Zepracidone. And then they basically looked at the days alive without delirium or coma during the 14-day intervention period. The other things they also looked at as secondary endpoints are 30-day survival, 90-day survival, time to freedom from their event, um, safety endpoints including extrapyramidal symptoms, because we know extrapyramidal symptoms tend to be associated with antipsychotics, as well as time to discharge. You'll see that there was no significant between group differences with respect to the secondary endpoints or the frequency of extrapyramidal symptoms. Well, that's interesting because that means that, believe it or not, giving Haldol or Zeprasidone while we know that they're associated with uh, extrapyramidal symptoms, they don't seem to occur um, as regular as readily in this study. The other thing is prolongation of, of QTC was much more common in patients who received zeprasidone, but no adverse effects were noted. Um, for haloperidol. And only about 11% of these patients had hyperactive delirium. So we can't say definitively that antipsychotics aren't helpful for some agitated patients. But with that being said, notice that the primary endpoint is right here. The difference is that the days alive without delirium was 8.5 days for placebo, 7.9 days for, for Haldol, and 8.7 days for Zeprasidone. And all of these are not statistically significantly different from one another. And what that means is giving these medications while people do do that does not seem to actually help people um, pr um, from developing de delirium down the road. It may help decrease symptoms initially, but it actually doesn't help uh, decrease your risk of delirium going forward. Uh, there is also an update. And what the update is, is that this update actually came out in 2024, and the investigators reported longer-term cognitive, functional, psychological, and quality of life outcomes, and they found no significant differences among group, any of the groups for any measured long-term outcome. And so what that also means is that Again, we give Haldol, we give Zeprasidone when someone is delirious, but it actually doesn't affect the onset of repeat delirium, and it also doesn't seem to improve long-term cognitive, functional, psychological, quality of life outcomes. So with that being said, managing acute agitation pharmacologically with antipsychotics is reasonable if it helps in that moment, but it does not actually help long-term outcomes for patients with delirium. So you might be wondering that how how can we help these patients who are delirious if these antipsychotics don't seem to work? Well, I'll tell you that I do have a, a physician I worked with at Stanford, and what you'll see is basic stuff can really help individuals prevent delirium. And some of the things are basic things, including education of family members about delirium so they can recognize it, presence of a clock so they know what exactly is going on. Because if you really think about it, delirium is something that already sets people off, but you would be set off if you were in a hospital, you were not at home, you were consistently poked and prodded at random times of the day, and you didn't know where exactly you were all the time. If you're already struggling with that, and now we put you in a hospital room, 
that in and of itself is not going to be conducive to you getting better. So the basic thing is trying to have a calendar in the room, trying to have a clock in the room, presence of familiar objects. So for a lot of my patients, I try to encourage their families to bring in pictures from home so they can continue to reorient themselves. And then of course, extend visitation time. So people who are, who are familiar with the patient can be around so they actually know um, that they're in a safe place. And you can see that non-pharmacologic interventions versus standard care was statistically significant. And what that means is the delirium while hospitalized was 5.6% in patients who had these interventions versus 13.3% in patients who did not have these interventions. So basic things like this can be very, very helpful. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gave you a very big overview into what delirium is. You know, you can use antipsychotics to manage acute agitation in the moment, but it does not help with long-term outcomes from delirium. The bigger thing to do is non-pharmacologic interventions such as these things. And above all else, just remember that um, you, when you give a medication, it does can have side effects, uh, including you know prolongation of the QTC and, um, of course, the black box warning that we talked about for first and second generation antipsychotics. So with that being said, hope you liked the video. Please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.